Before we get started, I did have a brief request from John Fisher. Dr. Fisher would like to clarify something from his slides this morning. So John, if you would like to do that. Thanks very much, Kelly. I inadvertently um, provided an alternative fact to you this morning. <laughs> Um, and it, it comes from a bad habit of mine, plagiarizing. I, ha I was using a borrowed slide and um, indicated that it was a, a, a captive deer herd in uh, Crow Wing County, Minnesota that had five of 14 positive animals in it. That was actually in Meeker County rather than Crow Wing County. And this was, of course, pointed out to me within seconds of getting down off of the stage by the good people from Minnesota. So sorry about that. That's Meeker County. OK, thanks, John. All right, so next, as you know, we do have the panel interview. Everyone is up here and excited to take your questions. This portion of the day is going to be facilitated by Kelly Cicillano Carter. She is with the DNR, and uh, she's going to be able to, I think, keep us on better track than I would. So I'm going to turn it over to Kelly, but I'll stick around for afterwards. Hello. All right, this is always a really fun part. As Kelly mentioned, we do have a lot of questions. So we're going to do our best to get through as many as we can. Some of you asked you wanted to speak to the panel um, or just throw the question out to the whole panel. So I think what we do for that is like we'll get one or two of you to answer um, and we'll see if anyone else wants to you know, share something after that. But we'll kind of look at when it's for everyone, we'll look for one or two of you to respond, okay? Um, all right, we're just going to kick it off. So Dr. Miller, I'm going to start with you. And everyone knows because that's outreach is my thing. So we're going to start with you, and the question is, what are the best approaches for agencies to get effective communication on CWD to hunters, and how can they increase knowledge and understanding? Okay, well, um, I think there's two questions there. So um, the first is how to get it to hunters, and we were just talking about this very thing is multiple platforms. Hunters are not going to, by and large, go to your agency site to look for the information. The first thing they're going to do is they're going to do a Google search. So having the information freestanding or having it linked from your sites uh, to be able to be freestanding. So I'm talking about reports, um, videos, uh, any of the fact sheets, have them in a, a and I'm not an IT expert, but they're going to Google it. They're not going to go to your site and then do a search and then look through to find the information. They're just going to go and do a, uh, an, inter an internet search on it. So anything that will pop up on its own. So for instance, if you're going to have some videos, also put them on YouTube, not just embedded in your agency site. So that would, that would be my recommendation, is use a variety of platforms, a variety of media, and get as much out there in various ways as you can, but not overwhelming information. Keep it short and sweet. Just enough, you know, give them the right facts. We can go too long into the information. And so, you know, I think that was the second part. Increasing knowledge and understanding. Increasing knowledge and understanding. Well, that's, that's the tough one um, because people will take what information They'll, they'll believe what they want to believe. They'll take the information that already agrees with their pre-existing cognitions, as the psychologists would say. So if it disagrees with what they want to hear, then they're not going to accept it. So that's, that's the hard part. And there's really um, looking at social networks, how do people get information? So we say word of mouth. What does that mean? Does that mean you know people they hunt with? Does that mean family members? That's really an important part of this whole understanding. How is the information being distributed within these social networks? And I'm not talking about social networks necessarily like Facebook, you know, and Twitter. I'm talking about social networks with you know the kind of nodes and linkages and so forth between people, friends and family, coworkers, people with their hunting clan, uh, hunting clubs, hunting camps. Um, how is this information being d distributed? That's a really important part to being able to know how people are understanding what they choose to believe, what they choose not to believe. Great. Thank you, Dr. Miller. This is for the panel. 
Since we can experiment on people, if studies do show that CWD can indeed be transmitted orally in those research ma uh, macaws, how will that affect deer management of one, captive cervids, and then two, free-ranging cervids? Who would be like the first to answer? I can answer regarding captive cervids. So if there's found to see some sort of human link with, with um, CWD, as far as captive cervids, um, they wouldn't be regulated any differently, really, because that's a human health issue. Now, what happens to the animals after they die would be something different. But as far as our program, I wouldn't see any specific immediate changes due to that. On the free-ranging deer side? Dr. Fisher, maybe? I think we're already seeing effects of that in a revision of the CDC language um, regarding the recommendations to hunters about consider having their uh, animals tested for chronic wasting disease if they've harvested that animal in an area known to be endemic for the disease. Thank you. Dr. Haley, regarding the genetics talk, how do you want to help from the farm, how do you want help from the farmed servant industry and in what ways? So I think um, one of the best things we could do with the farm servant industry is Can you hear him? Is that on? So I think one of the best things we could do with the farm servant industry is to try to identify, um, you know, what what levels of resistance are out there, how relevant they might be to um, to preventing infection, um, what sort of management um, tactics could we use, um, you know, whether that that be calling at a certain age, um, you know, similar similar to what was done with mad cow disease, where um, you know we're only testing animals over a certain age. Um, and animals younger than that age are not tested because those animals don't get BSE. Um, if, if we could kind of apply a similar line of thinking to CWD, um, that, that might help with management um, in both farmed and, and wild populations. The other thing is, um, you know, if we're able to identify uh, different levels of resistance, um, deer farmers can actually, uh, you know, try to help develop those deer uh, and provide them so that we could, uh, so that we could study them further and, and just exactly see exactly how how important they might be for for not just farm cervids but also for wild cervids. Thank you, um, Dr. Mathiasen. Were the experimentally inoculated voles orally exposed? Question mark. And then I don't know the second one. Did they shed prions once it was determined to they were determined to be infected? Two parts. Yeah. So the first part of that, yes, those the dams were. Uh, we're talking the the dams, correct? It said just voles. So I'm sorry. Yeah. So the the fawns actually were not inoculated. So the dams were inoculated, and the fawns were. Oh, we're talking about milk now, maybe. Um, yes, milk. Sorry. Voles or voles? I think it's voles. <laughs> it's voles. Oh, voles. V O L E. Sorry. <laughs> yes, sorry. You're right. There, voles. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, I have voles and fawns on my brain. Um, the uh, the voles were actually IC inoculated, and I'm not sure that they that anyone actually looked at whether or not they shed. Okay, Dr. Williams, Wisconsin has been at or near the top of the Boone and Crockett and Pope and Young record books for quite some time. Um, has the increase in CWD prevalence, prevalence over the last 10 years in that state caused a decline in the record book entries? Ooh, that's an interesting question. The because uh, we also have research in the center that, that's looking at that distribution of, of Boone and Crockett records in the in the state. Uh, I'm searching for my one of my graduate students, and I don't see her. her she she took off, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't think there's been a decline in the past. So if we say from 2002 to now, um, but they might be uh, spatially disparate from where you know you have most of the the um, the records as far as numbers for Wisconsin coming out of Buffalo County and and nearby counties and 
Um, I, th I think that's not in the heart of the prevalence areas. That's true, right? And so I, I, I don't think we've seen that trend for the, specifically for the state of Wisconsin, although um, I'm going to qualify that with the, th with the think. But, but it is a concern that we're thinking when you're starting to think about management for deer that has uh, different objectives where, where that objective might be for uh, very large and older males and that may be uh, counter to what management for chronic wasting disease uh, might be trying to achieve on the landscape. And that does pose some challenges that I think move beyond the biology and into um, social and political uh, decisions. Thank you. Can I add to that just a little sure. bit? Sure. Yeah, so um, we have an area that's uh, just to the, to the west of sort of our area where we originally found the disease. It's a, not a huge area, but it's an area where we now have prevalence of about 50% in the adult bucks. And it's fairly common for the hunters and landowners there to find dead animals on their property. Probably a good reason for that is they're probably dying related to CWD. And so I think it's a matter of not only where it is, but also what prevalence it gets mm -hmm. to as well before it has a, begins to have those kind of, those kind of impacts. Great. Thank you. Can I add something too? So um, I, I don't know whether this was the intention, but that question maybe gets at you know, how important is CWD? If CWD was found in Wisconsin for the past 20 years, and they're still seeing a large number of Boone and Crockett bucks, you know, how what, how big of a deal is CWD? And, and you know, that that's one side of the argument that some of you might hear, that CWD is not a big deal. We don't see, um, you know, for, the, for example, the slide that I showed, we don't see, um, you know, maybe declining populations of white-tailed deer. We don't necessarily see differences in the quality of white-tailed deer, but that doesn't mean that that we won't and that, that 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 doesn't mean that cwd is not an important disease and doesn't have very long lasting ramifications if, if you find it so i don't i don't um i hope that that question wasn't trying to get at that but um you know i, th I think it's important to realize that just because we're not seeing issues already that doesn't mean that that we're not being set up for some pretty significant issues down the road okay. this question is for the panel so research takes time so what are your recommendations for CWD given the current base of knowledge? And what are some of the actions that states should do now to minimize risk? Who might take that? Anyone who hasn't spoke yet, maybe? Well, I, I'll throw out a few things. I think we need a silver bullet. So I think we need to invest a lot more in attempting to do some vaccination work developed. Um, clearly, the last vaccination study that was done in Wyoming um, didn't turn out. Um, actually, an animals that were vaccinated were about eight times more likely to become infected than the controls. But um, Dr. Hoover uh, who worked with some folks in, in um, New York, and at least there's one publication that, that indicates there's a vaccine that might have some potential. So I think if there's a, if there's a silver lining in the long run, that would be something we need to pursue. Um, one of my sort of, I guess, pet things here is that uh, since bucks are so affected by this disease and it's such a big deal for hunters, um, if we could find ways to prevent them or reduce their infection rates other than shooting them, um, we might have a lot more uh, impact with the public in terms of trying to do something about this disease as well. So that would at least be a couple things I think are, are interesting and important. Anyone else on the panel? All right, Dr. Miller, has research been done on trust in tests? Do hunters trust a negative test enough to eat the deer? Uh, I don't know of any research that has asked um, about trust in the test themselves. Uh, most uh, states will, from you know, my personal contact with them, is when people are notified they have a positive animal, they turn the animal over. There are a few outliers of people who go ahead and eat the meat, but by and large, the vast majority of people 
uh, when they're notified their deer is positive, they turn the, uh, the venison over to the agency. So I think that kind of speaks right there that they, it's, it's kind of the, the, you know, question of a type one versus type two error. Do you want to err on the side of the test, you know, being a false positive and eating the meat or give up the venison and uh, go on with it? I think most people, the vast majority of people are willing to give it up. If I could add something to that. Um, one of the things that we always point out with the CWD test is that it is not a food safety test. It's a disease surveillance and monitoring test. And if you um, look at the results, there are basically two results, and negative is not one of them. It's either positive or not detected, and that is because we don't know if that animal is actually infected with that uh, prion or not. So there is no such thing as a negative test result, and again, that's not a food safety test, although it's frequently regarded as such. Thank you. Dr. Haley. Um, there's, it's called firewall theory question mark. Are you proposing genetically resistant captive cervids be released into the wild? Uh, at the moment, that's not what I'm proposing. Um, I think it's important, um, you, you know, there's a lot of concern that the cervid farming industry is playing some role in this, in, in the, the spread of the disease. Um, and I think that there's, you know, there's evidence for that and there's evidence that wild deer are playing an important role too. Um, and so, you know, in order to try to remove them from the equation, I think if we're able to find resistant animals and have those animals um, in the farm cervid population, uh, I mean, I, I don't see who wouldn't be happy having, uh, you know, one potential uh, role player in the, in the spread of the disease removed from the equation. Thank you. This question is for Dr. Hoover, but I'm gonna hand it to him because I don't think I'm gonna ask it correctly. <laughs> is this in Norwegian? No. <laughs> I, I do read Norwegian, so. Ah, okay, if PRP CWD localize like antigens, is there an opportunity to intervene with something like a vaccine? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> Well, I, th I think so. I've always been oriented towards uh, making vaccines, trying to do that. Um, I think Nick and I have a different opinion, uh, perhaps me being more, more the fool, Nick the optimistic. Um, but it, it, that comes from good basis. That, that's what I would think too, so that if you present the, um, the prion protein as uh, recognized, somehow recognizable by a deer, uh, and that immune response you could get, which would be hard, would not attack all the normal prion proteins of the deer or something else that's normal, like an autoimmune reaction. Um, maybe there is a possibility. Um, I still think, okay, so it's daunting because there is no known immune response to prions, even though they follow this immune-like pathway. Two, um, this is, um, the, the attempts have been made have had modest or no success. Uh, three, it's difficult to get funding for studies like this, which if they're done in deer, which I think you about have to do in the native host, uh, they're very expensive and the uh, National Institutes of Health or the National Science Foundation uh, really uh, don't see sufficient rationale to make that kind of investment. If CWD could be um, maybe perceived as a greater risk by the National Institutes of Health, maybe uh, we could get another project funded. But uh, it's it's a long shot and there'd be issues as to how that would be distributed in a way that would be sufficiently effective. Um, but uh, I would still like to try. <laughs> That's what a researcher does, is always think that uh, within reason, if you can make a rationale that uh, you would not, what was somebody said, it's uh, your, you're trying to often disprove some some uh, taken for granted um, aspect, and sometimes that's how you make real progress. So, 
Thank you. Done. For the panel, um, given all the unknowns on CWD transmission via saliva and urine, wouldn't we be farther ahead by stopping the movement of all live deer and elk and by stopping all movement of high risk parts of harvested animals? Anyone? Yes. <laughs> Not necessarily. I think, in my opinion, the biggest risk for moving the disease around is moving live animals around. The second biggest risk is moving parts of dead animals around. Um, I think the risk lowers considerably when you get down to products like um, the urine-based scents. But uh, I, I regard the risk as low, but not zero, and it is up to the uh, regulatory agencies to determine just how much risk they're willing to accept. So I'm going to respectfully disagree with John just a little bit. Um, so that question sort of is based on the assumption that animals that are moving, so I'm assuming you're talking about captives because not much else really moves. So well, yes, the wild animals move. Yeah, that's a that's a separate subject that I'm not going <laughs> to I'm not going to touch on that one. So if it's if it's captives, in order to move, they have to be within in the herd certification program. So wild deer, you know, they don't really understand those state borders, and they go about their business, and they they do move some. So I wouldn't say that the, the it's an, a correct assumption to say that movement legally of herd certified animals is is the the problem exactly about spreading the disease i think that's it's kind of an over overstatement um of that issue it's kind of an over, oversimplification i think because in order to move across borders they have to be part of our herd certification program and that's a five-year certification program and if i could respond to that i did not single out captive animals there i said live animals and then parts of dead animals. So the high, it's been uh, well documented that the disease has been moved around within the captive servant industry. And in other instances, it looks like it has wandered across borders into new jurisdictions in free ranging animals and also within states, expansion via movement of wild animals. And we've also seen movement within the captive servant industry within state too. Fortunately, I don't think we've seen that in uh, interstate movements yet. But I was, I mean, live animals, period. Privately owned, publicly owned. Thanks. And, and it's my personal opinion as a scientist, and you can pull my affiliation out of that. I firmly agree with the, the dead pieces parts aspect. Um, I feel like we all need to be more mindful of the movement of carcasses and associated parts. And that includes disposal on sites and disposal by states. I think we need to be a lot more mindful about what we're doing with carcasses. I'll just add quickly to that. So, you know, a lot of a lot of regulations are based on BSE. So we consider, uh, you know, the animals have to be deboned um, and prior to movement and and. BSE is very different than CWD, and we know there's high levels of infectivity in, in muscle and fat. Uh, and so to debone them, I mean, I, I don't honestly don't know how much that does um, to reduce the risk. The, the muscle and fat is, is equally infectious, and, and um, you know, so I don't, I don't know that it really, the, the regulations that we're using apply to a completely, almost a completely different disease. Dr. Mathias. One, one more thing, <laughs> and this is regarding the movement of uh, carcass parts. And I would go back to something that Tom Thorne said, obviously many years ago, because he's been gone for 13 years, said that uh, regulations and recommendations regarding carcass movement are all um, uh, substitution for proper disposal. So if these things were disposed of properly, it wouldn't matter if they were disposed of properly right on site where they were collected or after moving. Thank you. Dr. Mathiasen, have you used samples from the depopulated captive herds, servant herds to study vertical transmission? 
the answer to that is no. Um, I've looked at only wildlife um, animals, free-ranging animals, um, both from the Rocky Mountain National Park in elk tissue, as well as white-tailed deer. We're just starting to look at white-tailed deer. Um, again, these from free-ranging animals, not from captive. Thank you. To the panel, has the CWD pre prevalence rate ever gotten to zero after a hotspot has been identified and a program was implemented? I'll just, I'll answer that, that we think so. We think in New York State uh, it, it, it did, um, but, uh, and, and it's been 10 years since, since CWD was identified there and they went through an eradication program. Um, and, uh, you know, in 10 years they haven't seen new cases, but, um, you know, it's, it's just like, it's just like the tests. It just means that they haven't been detected. Uh, that may mean they're negative. It may mean they just haven't been found yet. I'd agree with Nick on that, and I guess it would depend on what the questioner really meant by a hot spot. That one, I would regard that one as appearing as a spark right now. But once we have an endemic focus, there's, it's never been brought back down to a 0% prevalence. If it's established, it's there. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure it's even ever been reduced once it got to that level. There is, um, there's one sort of analogous situation in northwest Wisconsin where there was a positive, uh, one positive doe that was found. I think it's been about five years now and uh, subsequently no po other positives. So whether that's a success, we'll have to wait a few years, but um, that's an, at least potentially another situation. Another one for the panel. Can CWD prions change over time, similar to a mutation, or evolve in such a way that a greater risk to other species, such as humans, could emerge? Um, theoretically, yes. Um, when prions cross a species barrier, uh, they, the prions that are made are made from the normal protein, no matter how close it is to the in infecting one, uh, and they're not there's, I think, enough evidence to show that they're not exactly the same. Uh, one of the most convincing things, I, uh, I think, is that uh, after adaptation occurs, say from deer to ferret or deer uh, to uh, the few rodent species that have been experimentally infected, they're, they're not very uh, susceptible and they're inoculated usually by an intracerebral route where you bypass a lot of sort of defense mechanisms. However, if you, if you isolate from the brain, say, the prions from that new species, they're not quite the same as the originals. And usually they will back infect the original species, but also they'll produce a shorter incubation disease in the new species, uh, say a bull, and they'll be susceptible, at least we found in two instances, by a oral route. So to me, that part was the most important part. But uh, again, I'd leaven that with we haven't found an instance where um, that has happened in nature. And I guess that's so it's, it's a potential. The prions made in the new species are not the same. And we also know that CWD and all prions are not identical. And in passage studies, different <laughs> sorts of variants, just like viruses, can be identified. So, and they are probably there in that original mix because all the misfolded proteins are not exactly the same. Fortunately, we're saved from those variants by the strength of the species barrier. So um, as long as that holds out, we're good. However, the big, the big, uh, uh, issue with that is, is BSE, is mad cow disease, where that happened uh, by a rare event, even though we were looking at prions made in cattle. Um, they crossed the species barrier to humans, and humans are not, you wouldn't predict, the most close species. So there's still some stuff we don't know that it could be of major importance about uh, species barrier and you could think of 
prions not being exactly the same anyway that virus in the same way that viruses aren't exactly the same we make or we wouldn't have different strains of influenza virus selected long answer sorry <laughs> that's great thank you dr miller why do you believe archery hunters have different feelings about cwd than rifle hunters it's a good question um it may be that they are spending more time in the woods over the th if they hunt the ex the extent of the three and a half month season, and feel that they are uh, able to observe deer more closely. Uh, it may that may possibly be one explanation. Um, as I said, they may have their um, Trust and attitudes towards the agency management clouded by other issues uh, that are particular to, to bow hunting. Um, they tend to be a much more specialized uh, and um, educated group as a whole uh, over deer hunting. If you talk to biologists, they will all say that they, uh, bow hunters, all think that they uh, know more about deer management, but um, I think that, um, you know, they're spent, they spend a lot of time out in the woods and they feel that, well, I'm not seeing uh, sick deer, so therefore it's not as much of a problem. But, but that's a really good question. I, I don't have any data, it's just speculation based on, these are relatively new findings that uh, we just pulled up within the last, less than a month. So uh, it, it warrants further research, but, um, Bottom line is I don't have any definitive answer. Thank you. This, I'm going to hand this one to Dr. Nichols. Okay. Okay, so you discussed desirable attributes of an anamorphic test, but not whether the test would be useful or desirable. What is the utility of anamorphic testing for free-ranging herds or is it primarily for the industry? Okay, um, I think that it could be useful for both and I'm, I'm the first one to tell you I'm not a wildlife person and there are experts in this room tenfold over anything that I know. What I would expect for wildlife folks and I want someone to jump in and correct me that it might be useful if you're trying to do some sort of um, capture release, um, prevalence determination, or monitoring individuals over time. That may be something that you might want to do. Um, as far as captives, it, it's useful for us to take a look at herds that are un under quarantine. So I think whether you all would decide it would be useful for you or not may depend on what your goals are. I think that it, it can be useful for, for both opportunities there, for both captive and, and wild. Thank you. I'll start with so you, Doug. Just to amplify that, it's pretty it's very useful for a lot of the research projects that are going on. Um, it's useful for trying to measure things like infection rates, if you can sample animals through time or if we can sample animals, we're putting radios on to find out whether they live or die and some of those kind of things. We want to test we can do on a live animal, so it's very useful for that. Thank you. Let's start with Dr. Williams, and then if anybody else would like to answer as well. What are the current research gaps needed for today's CWD management? Hmm. There's, there's quite a few. A lot of them were, were mentioned. I think one of the big ones, you know, I talked about the, the that applied research can it help us explore possibilities, and I, I think a better understanding of some of the transmission dynamics. I think Dr. Samuel emphasized that that hole there. That's that's a big one. But I think in a in a place like Michigan, you know, one of the big things is really having a good understanding of where we should allocate limited resources to to be looking next where do we where do we think we'll find it there's there's been some good work out of wisconsin uh looking at how we inform surveillance models with 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 good data and and that's in areas where there's probably a clear age structure to the infection 
the infected population, and uh, it's it's unclear whether those models transfer over to a place where the disease might be very new, and you might ha have it established in older animals. But but I think you know pulling together all these different risk factors to say where should we be looking, you know I I commented in the in in my talk that. Uh, the, the funding sources are, are quite limited and states are, someone else mentioned it as well, having to uh, shift money around to deal with CWD and, and, and trying to figure out where to allocate those samples in a large state, uh, especially um, uh, early on in the disease or before they have the disease. I, I think that's a pretty major gap in, you know, trying to quantify some of those risk factors uh, for the disease popping up in the first place. Anyone else? There's, there's a huge need to evaluate um, the control strategies mm -hmm. that we have been using and to develop alternative control strategies once we've identified the disease. Uh, doctors Haley and Samuel, are some deer resistant to CWD or do they have a longer incubation period and is, or is that a difference in terminology? <laughs> um, so it all depends on how you define resistance, okay? Uh, and so when I talk about resistance, it doesn't, like I said, these animals are not immune. Uh, they potentially have longer incubation periods, um, but, uh, you know, so how do you want to define resistance? They, they don't get it as quickly as, as their um, companions. Um, that, that's how I define resistance. So what we found in Wisconsin that um, for sympatric deer, the genotype dictates what your probability of becoming infected is. So if you're in the more susceptible uh, genotype, then your likelihood of becoming infected, um, everything being equal as far as we can tell, is higher than if you're the more resistant genotype. And then in addition, there's a longer incubation period as well that goes with that. So that the ones that are resistant have a longer time that they live post-infection, as best as best we can tell from field data, and I think that was agreed with most of the things you find too. I, think I can add to that too a bit, just on the experimental side. We we've had a little over 200 deer now in experimental studies, and and so far to date we've not found any total resistance. Again echoing what these guys are saying, we've seen a delay in being able to detect disease, but not a resistance. Thank you. Doctors Nichols and Hoover, is semen being evaluated for CWD prions? And are there any data available? They also mentioned embryos. Are there results from studies of scrapie? Um, some semen has been tested. I'm going to check with Dr. Matthias in here. Um, and, uh, but theoretically, yes, uh, semen could be tested by the modern amplification assays. Uh, I don't know that we have a positive with that, but it's a very logical thing to do. We, we've not tested sufficient numbers of semen, so we've had challenges in actually getting semen. I was talking to Tracy and, and to Dr. Samuels both about this, is that we've had um, trouble getting sufficient tissue, um, whether that be testicular tissue or semen itself, to really be able to say anything about it. But we'd love to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think the question also touched on the data from uh, Scrapey. So there was a study done where they utilized PMCA to look at semen from rams that were positive with scrapie, and they did indeed find that. Um, so far, nothing has been published. Hopefully, folks will, will get some more work on deer to see whether that is or is not the case um, with CWD. And then that also begs the question that we run into often when we're dealing with amplification assays. It's like, okay, so it's in there. What does that mean? in the real world. Is there a sufficient amount in there? Does that, is an animal inseminated, let's say with a positive semen straw, does that animal then go on um, to become positive later on? And, and in, we, we don't know. And that would, that would be a very good thing to find out. So to collect that um, material from a positive buck and then do lap AI, which is 
for our industry group, that's a very common practice. So that would be very good. Yeah, just a, a note, that's one of the things that we would really like to know and have never been able to fund a study where we would look for the lowest exposure dose that would infect a deer or what if it was three, three serial doses and it was even lower. Um, the reason that that's important but it's not sexy is that, for example, in vaccine studies, um, we, you really need to challenge with a dose that emulates natural exposure. Lots of vaccine studies have been wrong because the challenge doses are too high. And uh, it, it has, what Tracy just mentioned also has implication. At a level we know we can find now by amplification, uh, we need to take the studies down below what is infectious by everything we can do in order to have a more rational idea about whether minute amounts we're detecting, which can go below the amount needed to infect, for example, a transgenic mouse, um, we can interpret those better. It's, it's always good to know the practical significance of what you're doing when you have really good technology um, that can go maybe beyond nature. Thank you. Dr. Miller, this is a little long, so stay with me. Among the states included in the Human Dimension Study, you found that greater than 65% of hunters felt the agencies were sufficiently managing CWD. What percentage of those states have feeding and baiting bans? Is a feeding and baiting ban generally well received in the study states, or has such bans caused public turmoil? Um, I think the only state involved in those studies that had any feeding allowed was Wisconsin, any baiting. Could be wrong in that. But there was a backlash to the baiting ban in Wisconsin, and anyone here can weigh in or correct me on that, to the point where baiting was reinstated in the northern part of the state. Uh, Illinois, Colorado, the Dakotas, I'm not sure about Nebraska, but I don't think so. Anyone could, but I don't believe any of the other states that have been involved in the studies uh, permitted baiting. So I think Wisconsin was the only one of those uh, included that had a pre existing uh, uh, permitting on, on baiting. Thank you. So, it, I mean, it was pretty controversial in Wisconsin, and particularly in the northern part of the state where there wasn't any CWD. And so, uh, that's why it was. So right now the situation is that um, areas that have CWD or are close to areas that have CWD, it's, it's currently banned. But there's some move in the legislature to kind of release some of those things after a given number of years after positive or detected or something like that. So it's, it continues to be a fairly controversial topic. The the issue um, with with baiting is a cultural issue and what's what's really interesting with deer hunting is you get two states side by side Wisconsin and Illinois for example uh, and deer hunting is totally different completely different so you have hunters who put on drives with hunters on stands they hunt over bait versus hunting the entire day out of a tree stand so what's considered to be an ethical practice in one state will end up being codified into regulation through legislation. What is considered to be an unethical practice will be prohibited through legislation in that same state. Right across the state line, the exact opposite could be true. So in Virginia, where you could use dogs, Pennsylvania, no way. Pennsylvania used to have the, the statute with the maximum number of hunters in a party was 25. So, you know, there is just, it's a very, our, our laws, our regulations tend to be based on what we consider to be ethical practice based on the culture of hunting in that state. And baiting is no exception. For the panel, do any of you have a recommendation for sampling frequency for sufficient monitoring of areas that has not yet been found to have a CWD positive deer? Yeah, 
Yeah, so th there's two issues. I think I think the major one, um, John really talked about this, and the word is look and look harder, look again. Um, this is a very clustered disease on the landscape, and if you're not sampling intensively in areas that are at high risk, there's a good chance you're not going to find it, and I think sort of the recent example of that is Arkansas. Um, frequency matters as well. When you, I don't know that we have a good idea of when you, if you go in and intensively sample an area and decide it's quote unquote CWD free, when do you need to go back? I don't know that we have a good handle on that. I think off the top of my head, I'd say something like maybe five years, something like that, um, just as a ballpark. But it's it's a real challenge, and it's not a, it's not an inexpensive way to, to detect disease. I think the the what people have come up with more recently has been called weighted surveillance, where animals that are at higher risk, um, like mature bucks, like taxidermied animals, and in some cases road kills, depending on whether those are high, those animals are higher risk. Those animals can be used and be tested to detect the disease. Um, I think that's a good way to detect, pretty efficient way to detect. Uh, the question I think that we haven't really addressed or answered very well, and that is, what is the disease level by the time you can detect it with those methods? And um, is it soon enough that you can actually do something? And so, so it's it's just a really tough issue to deal with, and, and it's it's something that we all struggle with for sure. If I could add something to that, and it's quite obvious. The question's obviously geared towards active surveillance programs, and, the, the, and uh, Mike addressed it very well. But that is all <laughs> in addition to strong passive surveillance programs that ascertain that absolutely every animal out there that looks like it could possibly have chronic waste and disease is tested for chronic waste and disease due to neurological abnormalities or wasting. And there are a lot of disease, other diseases and processes that can cause either one or both of those things in an animal. But it's important to test those animals that look most like an animal with CWD, in addition to these other, uh, other groups that Mike mentioned. Great. Thank you. To the panel, has CWD always been present at some level and it only has been recently detected? I'll jump on that one. Uh, I, the answer to me is clearly no. I mean, in in Wisconsin, we have, I think, a really good example of this because our deer are, are pretty sedentary. We don't have, you know, major seasonal movements or those kind of things. And it's very clear that this disease is spreading across the landscape and infecting more and more animals, just like a newly introduced, introduced disease would. Um, it's, it's clearly killing animals. It's, this is not something they've experienced historically, that they've become adapted to because the mortality rates are very high. So I think all the evidence that we see suggests this is a brand new disease to these, to at least the animals that we're dealing with in this current historical period. I mean, I don't know how if you said, well, we go back 20,000 years or something, I don't know. But certainly with the animals that we have on the landscape now, this is, everything indicates this is a new disease to them. It's not been here and we haven't detected. I'd like to weigh in on this on the standpoint of communication. Um, this is a uh, perception that's out there and it persists. We've asked hunters this in Illinois, and as I can't remember offhand the proportion, but a surprising percentage of hunters believe this is true. And there are um, others out there who promote this that for justification on not doing anything. And um, this, I think, is a real threat to CWD management, that if, if hunters especially are led to believe that this has always been present, it always will be present, there's nothing that we need to do about it, that could be a grave mistake. Thank you. Another if I, one. If I could add to that just quickly, rather, and in addition to perhaps always having been here, there's a perception out there that no matter where you are, it's going to be there sometime, and it's going to spread everywhere in uh, 
in the areas where susceptible hosts are present. And again, this is often used as justification for not taking pr uh, proper preventive measures, and I think there's great risk in looking at it that way. It, it, if there's one message that I've gotten so far today and everything I've learned about CWD is if you don't have it, you don't want it because you're not going to get rid of it and you should be doing everything that you can to prevent the introduction of that disease and the establishment of it. Thank you. Again, for the panel. In thinking of applying existing knowledge of transmission, what are the panel's thoughts on using minimal um, baiting and supplemental feeding in the face of trying to reduce and prevent transmission? Can you read that one more time? Thinking of applying existing knowledge of transmission, what are the panel's thoughts on using minimal, I think it's minimal, or minimal maybe, baiting and supplemental feeding in the face of trying to reduce and prevent transmission? Someone had that? I'm... If, yeah. if missing from that is removing the animals when they come to the bait, that's, then I think we're going to have a speaker talk about that in Illinois tomorrow. Um, but I'm not sure if just baiting them and bringing them in is what we're talking about. I, I thought it may, might be related to um, the use of bait and feed in general. Or is it? Is the person who wrote that question still available? All right, we'll put it aside for now. Move on. Well, let, let me at least give a little answer. All right. I mean, all the wildlife science that we know about says that baiting and feeding draws animals together unnaturally. Um, that's an opportunity for contact between animals. That's an opportunity for animals to leave fecal deposits, urine deposits, saliva deposits in a concentrated area that other animals are going to visit. And there's been numerous studies on those kind of things. And the answer is, if you have a disease that's communicable in your deer, you don't want to feed and bait, I think, pretty much, period. Unless Whether it's TB or CD, CWD or whatever. Unless you're going to call every... Unless you're going to call? Yeah. Or if you had a vaccine, you could deliver that way. That may be another, yeah. another reason. But, but not just... Okay, for the panel, is genetic manipulation really an option for free-ranging animals? Isn't manipulating captive animals isn't manipulating captive animals easier than wildlife? I guess I'll have to answer this. Um, yeah, I, I I'm not sure what sort of genetic opportunities there are for for wild deer, and and to go back to the question that was asked of me earlier, um, would are, was I suggesting that we release, you know, what we think are resistant deer out on the landscape? And, you know, I, I hope we don't get to that point. Um, and I hope that, that Dr. Fisher is right, that, that CWD won't get to every nook and cranny. Uh, but, you know, if, if it were to get to that point, um, you know, could, could there, there's precedent for, for the deer farming industry to help um, play a role in restocking wild populations. And, and, you know, I hope we don't get to that point, but, um, you know, if we're able to work things out with the, with the farming side of things, then, then they could potentially um, serve to, to repopulate areas. Thank you. So um, I don't think it's a very practical strategy, perhaps as a repopulation strategy. One might consider that, but in terms of supplementing wild populations, I don't think you can reduce release enough genetically different animals to overwhelm what's going on out there. You've got movement of animals dispersal across the landscape from populations with a much different genetic structure likely, and, and you're just going to have a, probably a very, um, very much a dilution effect that's likely to occur. So I wouldn't see releasing those kind of animals as being very practical in that scenario. Thank you, Dr. Miller. We are going into year three of CWD management in Michigan. Are there any suggestions for avoiding CWD fatigue with the public, uh, such as avoiding information overload as we continue management in the next several years? Well, similar to what we do with the deer, I would recommend monitoring um, the stakeholders. Uh, when I say monitoring, um, what do they know? 
Where are they getting their information? Where are they getting their misinformation? And that will, I think, give you some guidance and understanding uh, what you need to deliver, how you need to, deli to deliver it, and to whom you need to deliver it. And until you have that, uh, just information itself getting out there, you don't know if it's being picked up and used, you don't know if it's being discarded. So until you have a real baseline uh, to work from, uh, I would say that that's the first start. Then after that, then you can um, start to maybe get a better idea of, of what messaging is working, what messaging isn't working, and, and why. Thank you. For the panel, how can prions be inactivated? And how do you sterilize instruments, equipment, et cetera, that were infected from a, you know, a positive animal? I'll take a stab at that one and then add on. So that's a continuing problem, and it's a problem for us when we're thinking about animal arm diagnostics, right? So those instruments we don't want to reuse. Tonsil biopsy instruments come immediately to mind. Um, it's also an issue about decontaminating fomites. Um, currently, the um, the the decon that that is used is bleach, but that's also really you know corrosive to instruments and whatnot. Um, it's it's difficult to do on site, though we do do that after a depopulation event. The soil is removed and then buried in some high um, prevalence pens. Feeders are not reused. Waters are not reused. Some of that's buried. We've had folks burn their buildings where it's been positive, but decon's an issue because it's it's difficult to get off of surfaces. And then how do you definitively determine that your decontamination procedure's been effective? So when Dr. Hoover was talking about developing methods to testing fomites, I think that's, that's one of those knowledge gaps that kind of came up earlier, what don't we know? We want to know how effective our decontamination strategies actually are. In a laboratory, it's a little bit different. We can get a little more aggressive, but on sites, it's a real problem. Anyone else? Yes. OK. Uh, we, we know it's harder to decontaminate fomites because of surfaces, and uh, so that, that's an issue. That, uh, But we can simulate it reasonably well now. So. Thank anyway, you. you have to do a lot with bad <laughs> with bad stuff. So, <laughs> um, one normal sodium hydroxide and twenty percent bleach, and we've destroyed a lot of lab surfaces uh, and <laughs> floors when doing that. So, again, for the panel, and I think we only just have a couple minutes left, so we'll do a couple more questions. Okay. So CWD was first discovered in a joint research facility in a Fort Collins, Colorado, in Fort Collins, Colorado in 1967. Is there a possibility that CWD is a product of humans experimenting with genetic engineering? And if there is, will we ever know the truth? <laughs> Dr. Anyone want to take that one? Yeah, Dr. Samuel will answer this. <laughs> <laughs> It's one, it's one of his areas of expertise. Uh, I've not seen anything published on this. <laughs> no panel members. Okay. Uh, I guess our last question is, given that we are now seeing population declines in some western deer and elk herds, is there any reason to believe we won't see similar declines in the eastern and midwestern herds as the prevalent rates, prevalence rates increase in those herds? Anyone on the panel? Well, so the certainly the situation in Wisconsin, I, I think, um, I think we're sort of about five years away from getting to a point where prevalence is high enough that we'll begin to see an impact on a very productive white-tailed deer herd in southern Wisconsin. Um, I think it's a, in most species that we know of that, that we've studied in elk, mule deer, and white-tailed deer, when female prevalence gets to a certain threshold, um, and it varies be between the species because each of the species have different habitats and different reproductive rates and those kind of things. But basically the key is when the female infection rate gets high enough that we're increasing mortality enough to change the demographics from positive to negative, um, those thresholds are there. We think it's probably on the order of 20% or so maybe 25 percent in white-tailed deer in Wisconsin. It's probably lower in animals that are in the west, further west, because 
they're not as productive. It's different for elk because elk are much less productive than deer. So I think that threshold is there. It's just a matter, I think, when you cross, begin to cross that threshold. Mm -hmm. I mean, remember when animals become infected on average, they're probably living only, you know, another two years or so. Their, their lifespans are being shortened. So just the, the demographics is going to tell you that those populations are eventually going to decline. The alternative, of course, is we could stop hunting them. And if we do that, then we can maybe preserve those herds for a bit longer. But there's even situations. So you know, there's a study in Colorado out of out of Boulder that Mike Miller did. Um, even in an unhunted population, that population was beginning to decline. So this is a, an issue we're going to have to deal with long term. I think the the sort of potential saving grace to this is what about these genetic shifts, and what's that boat? I think what that's going to do is a little bit challenging for us to know at this point. I guess I kind of have a follow-up question to that for, for Mike. So are you seeing genetic shifts in Wisconsin? And are the models accounting for that? And do you think that those genetic shifts will, will help? Um, we haven't looked in Wisconsin. Uh, it's It's a it's a challenging problem because of movement of deer across the landscape and there's also some movement of genetics across the landscape. Has it been long enough yet? I think that would be a question to see a genetic shift. Um, Malia DeVivo's work um, on mule deer in Wyoming suggests that she's seen from studies that were done earlier to her studies that she's seen a genetic shift going on in mule deer there. So um, it seems to be coming. Um, but I think how fast it is going to come depends on the selection pressure. So as prevalence gets higher, the selection pressure ramps up, and the, those selection for for um, more resistant genotypes would happen more rapidly. I think that's what you would typically I would expect you to see in a captive situation is that you'd have high selection pressure because of high transmission and much more rapid selection for the uh, resistant genotypes. Yes, Dr. Fisher. Kelly, <clears throat> if I could just clarify something I said earlier, it wasn't, wasn't an alternative fact, but when Dr. Nichols and I were discussing live animal movement and herd certification, I indicated that to our knowledge we have not seen interstate spread of chronic wasting disease in the captive servant industry. And to clarify that, that is since the uh, implementation of the herd certification program. Um, prior to that, we saw a lot of it, and we saw uh, herds in a couple of our western states spread the disease to numerous other herds. We saw a herd in one of our western states uh, ship animals to Saskatchewan, captive elk, and from an index herd there, 38 other herds were infected within that province uh, through primary or secondary movement. We're fortunate we haven't seen this yet. Oh, oh and then the shipment of animals from uh, Saskatchewan to South Korea was the uh, source of the introduction there. One situation that often gets overlooked is the movement of animals from Colorado to the zoo in uh, Toronto where the disease was uh, spread to that facility through live animal movement. And again, we haven't seen this on an interstate basis since the um, implementation of the herd certification program, but we have detected the disease in numerous herds after they have been certified as being at low risk for CWD. Those herds have shipped animals interstate. Many of those were tested and found to be um, not detected results, others have not been tested or were lost to testing. So just wanted to, to clarify that in the complete history of CWT as we know it rather than just since uh, 2014 and the implementation. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, well Wait, we answered, oh. Uh, I just have uh, one other point to add to the, to the, the question. Uh, if or, or when you would see reduction in white-tailed deer herds, you, a couple of things are going to happen. The agencies need to make sure you're out front getting the information out to the public, uh, especially to hunters, because the outdoor press will beat you to it. And if you don't do that, you're not going to have control over the messaging. Secondly, is if and when that does occur, 
you will have a groundswell of support to combat CWD in your states because that is exactly what the hunters are afraid of. Thank you. Okay, well, I just want, I, we went through almost all of the questions. For those who didn't get your question answered, I believe that this, many of the speakers, if not all of them, will be here tomorrow. So please go and see them on breaks. Um, if you don't mind, can we give them a round of applause for being good sports? <laughs>